Welcome to another episode of Fight the Burnout. If you're watching this on a record on the video, I, I am in a different spot. So there you go. You get some new some new scenery. Uh, today we have a special guest. I am going to do my best not to not to hash up his last name, but Matt Damiancy. I think I probably could just got that wrong. I think. Uh, but he is a ex police officer and now a chaplain for a uh, police department. And he's going to talk to us today about his career, but also what he's seeing and helping, how he's helping uh, as a chaplain now. So, uh, Matt, why don't you take it away? Tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit of your backstory and background. Um, as far as law enforcement, I was a cop in Connecticut and in the DC area, worked patrol, peer support, SWAT, full time police academy instructor. The whole time I was a cop, I was also a college strength coach, first at Yale, then at Georgetown, where I also did campus ministry for the athletes. I got hurt on the job, had a workers' comp nightmare, two to three years of surgeries that went wrong, got heavily medicated on opiates, muscle relaxers, antibiotics, my immune digestive endocrine system collapsed, and I have some permanent disability issues. I was pretty trashed up, and so... At the advice of my very holistic psychiatrist that had yoga, meditation, a nutritionist, Reiki, and massage in her office in D.C., which was is still probably rare on the East Coast and still rare now, um, but she told me to move to Los Angeles for functional and integrative medicine. So, and I'm not the type of guy that I would think, and the people that like played college football with me are like, dude, you live in Manhattan Beach now? Like what? Because I'm kind of a hillbilly. I like hunting and shooting and off-roading and the woods. So I moved out here for functional and integrative medicine, had to do a lot of work to get work comp to approve it. So I see doc well, I was seeing doctors that do a lot of deep tissue work. I saw a chiropractor and physical therapist three, four times a week back then a primary care that does vitamin IVs, supplementation, nutrition, um, balance my hormones, a psychiatrist that does neurofeedback meditation and like deep psychoanalysis and things like that. Um, so that's why I moved to California. And then about, uh, I forget, it, it took a couple years to recover because I was, people don't believe it. I was obese, chronically ill and severe chronic pain. Um, and if I had a picture to show you, people wouldn't, you wouldn't recognize me and wouldn't believe it. But I got back in shape. Most people have no idea that I have tons of medical issues. Went back to grad school for a second master's in sports psychology. Wanted to get a PhD in clinical psych to work with first responders, veterans, and athletes. Once I finished the sports psych master's, I got a new work comp caseworker that literally told me he was my life coach and that I cost too much money. So I should go back on opiates and benzos and muscle relaxers. And it was hell, but my medical benefits and disability pay got cut off for three years or a little more. And got I got dragged through court fighting for the integrative and functional medicine to be like, hey, I got off drugs and I got healthy and productive. Like, and they want me to go back on drugs. So that was a nightmare. And that's why I didn't get a PhD. Because I lived week to week by a GoFundMe. I had to sell my cars, empty my bank account. Um, but I got a full ride for a third master's in theology at Loyola Marymount University. And I did that just to anchor my faith and my head during this nightmare. Yeah. So I had no idea that I would use it eventually to be a chaplain. I focused on something called spiritual direction, which is spirituality which is much broader than just religion. Like spirituality is how we live out the most important values in our life. Yeah. How do we relate to our community? How do we relate to humanity? How do we continue to find meaning and purpose through adversity and suffering? And how do we relate to a higher power if we believe in that? And how do you relate and find peace, joy, love, and wherever your divinity is every day, not just when you're going to a Bible study or church or the synagogue or the mosque, like, if, if you're one of a belief that God created everything, God is everywhere, every day and every one, not just in the holy rollers at the religious institution. So I took a deep dive in that, which also is a heavy emphasis and depth psychology, like psychoanalytical psychology. And I also took a deep dive. I started going on. I never did retreats more than three days when I was a cop and a coach. One, I had two jobs and two I would never take three days away from strict eating or the gym. Yeah. 
And that's kind of ridiculous, but that's how regimented I was. So I started going on 10 day re silent retreats in the Buddhist tradition, the Christian tradition, a Native American vision quest. And I was doing this to heal myself still from the retirement and the identity thing that is a big part of your work. Um, and also just because the, the legal case was a nightmare, like I was like the director's award, top police academy graduate, made the SWAT team faster than anybody, became a police academy instructor faster than anybody to where they had to change the rules. And now it's not the cops, but it feels like your agency. It's not the agency, but it's like I went from hero to zero, Charles Manson. And because I'm being productive in retirement and I cost money. I'm getting attacked. So it was psychologically super stressful. So that's what I used the theology masters was for myself. And I did an additional two year spiritual direction school at the same time, because I wanted to do it with Protestants. I was at a Jesuit Catholic university. So I did another two year program in spirituality, depth psychology, and the contemplative practices of the religious traditions, which are the mindfulness and the meditation practices that each of the major religious traditions have that so few people are aware of. Um, so I did that. And throughout my retirement, I was coaching NFL combine prep and doing the sports psychology for that. Yeah. Um, but then I eventually moved. It, it's, it, it's a longer story, but I got into going back into peer support and chaplain volunteer work. Everything I do is volunteer but there's a number of agencies in Los Angeles that I ride along with. I lift at the stations. Sometimes I'll, I've even got to do EVOC and pit training and shooting and DT. So I, I spend time in the trenches with cops trying to develop relationships long term. So where we can talk about proactive things versus most of peer support in America, peer support chaplains and the mental health professionals are only for PTSD, addiction and suicide. So after you're on the ledge, we come in and offer help, which stigmatizes you. So many people don't want to talk to peer support, a chaplain or a psychologist, because they don't want everyone around them thinking you're the person that's suicidal or an alcoholic, or am I not going to get the detective slot or the SWAT or the gang or the narc unit's not going to want me because I'm weak, I'm broken, I'm crazy. Everything is stigmatized. So if you can develop relationships where proactively you talk you don't lecture and you don't give unsolicited advice, but through the relationships, people may ask about nutrition, fitness, meditation. Hey, can you help me find a therapist and not tell the department? Absolutely. Some people need substance abuse treatment. We know some places that only treat cops and firemen. So you can go get help for that. So letting people know that self-care isn't selfish, having life balance is important, doing your best to model it. And also that seeking help is is not does not mean that you're weak crazy or broken and you can i think you can only do that if you're in a position of trust and not this person that only shows up when somebody's completely jacked up yeah. so that's kind of what my mission is i've been a cop so thank god they give me some credibility for being a cop and i ride along and i ride evening and graveyard shift and in very dangerous areas and on a very consistent basis so they know they eventually they're like, we know he cares because he's around and he's sitting in the back of a squad car behind the cage with his knees in his face, you know, in the ghetto yeah. from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. So maybe he cares a little bit and maybe after a year or two, maybe I'll talk to this guy yeah. about something. Yeah. So that's kind of what I do now. It's, and I also do peer support for nonprofits a lot of phone and email peer support. And just because I know so many cops, police psychologists, lawyers, people get referred to me where I do phone and email peer support. And people don't realize it. There are people that have PTSD so bad or are so worried about remaining anonymous. They'll only do email. So you got to be like a pen pal for people or they'll only do texting and barely phone calls. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad that I can... I can be there for these people and I'm affiliated with agencies, but I'm not employed by the agency. So there's, yeah, there's some like connect there, which is quite good for officers because yeah, I know that, like so many officers that I talk to and even, even here in New Zealand and that, you know, they're so worried about the, the, um, 
what people think of them or what's going to happen if they ask for help. It's awesome to see that you're doing and that, you know, there's a, there are a lot of people as well, you know, a lot of groups and different things that are out there that aren't necessarily for that cop or that first responder that's like, I'm broken, which we're never broken, but I'm at the bottom of the cliff. You know, I've fallen off the cliff and I'm laying down here waiting for the ambulance. Um, I'm full on with that about that, that almost the preventative side of stuff. The, 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 um, mm -hmm. in there before, before you even have the struggles, because as cops, especially as cops, we see 18 times as much trauma as somebody will in their entire life. In our, in the first mm -hmm. year, there's a study, I think it was out of New York that did it on, on cops. They see 18 times as much trauma in their first year as a human will in their life. I didn't know that stat. That's pretty powerful. I'm, I'm trying to find the research paper. Somebody posted on Instagram, or sorry, on LinkedIn. Um, and I've seen it a couple times pop up. But there's also cops are five times more likely to get PTSD than any other profession. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why are we not preventing this? Why are we not doing, giving all the tools and strategy like you have and like I have to that? Um, I wanted to ask you real quick, Matt, uh, what's your definition? Of, what would you say your definition of burnout is specifically? I'd say burnout is one when the job starts losing meaning and purpose. When you go from somebody that at least as a cop, cops that are gung ho and proactive. And right now, this is a curse in America that even people that want to be proactive because they may not have support from their chain of command or their community. And as or the district attorney, a lot of people can't be proactive because is it worth a foot chase, a car chase, or getting in a fight or a shooting? And then I might go to jail, and the criminal's not going to get punished. Um, but before this shift, the burnout would be is when you stop being proactive, and it's sarcastic bitterness, us against them. The job doesn't have meaning and purpose, and. Also, if we talk to your friends and family, they would say like things have changed. People self-medicate with alcohol, tobacco, sleeping with people they shouldn't sleep with. Um, when you're, you have exceeded your coping skills and lost pleasure and enjoyment in life. And, there, and it's no longer an adventure. Like being a cop is an adventure. That's why most of us signed up yep. and it turns into a paycheck. So when it just comes down to I'm just getting paid and it's about salary and benefits, then I think you're burned out and you're not finding meaning and purpose intrinsically and trying to lock up people, you know, and make a difference in the world. Yeah. So when that purpose disappears out of what you do, you know, when you lose that purpose to, to, to thrive, to strive for greatness. I love that. Um, do you... Tell me, do you have an experience? Do you have something that comes to mind when you think about your own life and your own journey where you felt like you were burned out? So the most different, I thankfully never on the job did it happen, but I went into the profession with already, I had a deep spiritual conversion in undergrad and college yeah. where I, and I was already meditating and journaling and I, I had apartments as a cop that had a mattress on the floor, a desk with candles and a bookshelf. I didn't own a TV. I, people called me the warrior monk. And I meditated and journaled like two to three hours a night after a shift. Um, so, and I was in spiritual direction throughout my career, which is people aren't familiar with it, but I would find priests that were also therapists with a background in psychology. And one of my best friends is also has a master's of divinity, a master's of marriage and family therapy, a PhD in religion and psych. So I had people that I processed everything with throughout my career. Yeah. Sorry. So the dogs, the dogs decided they wanted to bark at something that wasn't there. So they're good. <laughs> apologize for that for you. And that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So throughout my career, like the things that might bite most people in the ass, I went home and journaled about it, emailed my friend, my spiritual director, meditated, processed it every single day. When I got overwhelmed is when I started having botched surgeries and it's like, and I got fat and I literally lost control of my bodily functions and I, and I had internal infections and I was chronically ill. And some doctors are trying to tell me, including my 
psychiatrist was being like, Hey Matt, like this might be over. And I'm like, nah, the next doc, somebody's going to fix me. Somebody's yeah, going to fix me that. and I'm going to go back. I love the warrior mindset. Like it's so like, it, it's so powerful, but at the same time can be so destructive. I don't know if you've seen that as well. Like obviously everything has a yin and a yang, but man, when yeah. you wreck that thing on something. It's just like, I am on a mission, get out of my way. So like I can, and I can see it. So, sorry, I just had to interrupt there, just bring awareness to that because that is, that is something that people also, it, it cops, especially we have it, you know, first responders, mm -hmm. I feel like cops and military, obviously they have to have it, but cops have to have it all the time when we're at home because we, you know, we, we work where we live and that drive, but we all, we have to make sure that, that drive is on the right path. Because otherwise that drive can just take us down the dark, the dark, dark, dark side. Um, okay, so you were burnt, you, you felt like you were burnt out with everything that was going on. Doctors are telling you, hey, this might be the end. You're, you know, the, we don't know what else we can do. What happened next? Well, then I eventually got forced to retire. And I mean, the psychiatrist was right. Like, I was, hey, I've had bad football injuries. I came back from all of them, right? So it's good to be positive and optimistic, like you said, but the acceptance that being Mr. Patrol Cop in the ghetto or a SWAT guy, like, it's over for real. And so are all those friendships and relationships. So um, even though I, I wouldn't, I had the identity as a coach and doing ministry as well, obviously still, my identity and the warrior archetype, like the unconscious powers of that identity are so deep and strong and very difficult to let go. So then I moved to California and I'm fat and sick and on tons of meds. And now I have to do that journey. And just seeing a cop car go down the road was depressing. And it was so hard. I have so many good cop buddies that I actually like didn't respond to their calls. It was just too painful. It was way too painful. Um, so there were, I don't know how long it was. And I busted my butt in therapy and physical therapy and with the Cairo and with the doctors and my nutrition. And, you know, I, I rehabbed my butt off to come back and go back to school and everything. But it was a mo many years journey to truly get over, like really that it's done, you know, because part of me, you know, I can never be a cop again based on some of my medical limitations, but yeah, it took years and years of a lot of therapy and meditating and journaling and yoga and retreats to um, really come to acceptance that all that's done and over. Mm. So yeah, med a forced medical retirement, but I think, and I've seen even a medical, even a regular retirement after 20, it's, there's huge transitions that we're not preparing people for in the military, police, and fire, because these jobs are so unique and special, and so are the relationships, and so is the I identity. Um, so yeah, those were my dark, dark times, and then obviously during the legal case, when I had no income and they cut off all the medical care, another period of severe darkness that that's when I leaned into my faith and doing all those retreats and getting into the depth psychology and the spirituality and even heavier into meditation and yoga during those years, just so leaning into right the that pain. Was, that was the second. So you, you left, you had all the injuries, you had all the stuff, got to dark days worked your way out of it then did you just take those same tools that you used to work out of it to then apply during the legal case yeah and i went deeper like i said like it went even deeper into like two hours of meditation every day one hour of yoga every day going to therapy like twice a week you know going to spiritual direction once a week where it's usually like a once a month thing um and I was studying the theology, the spirituality, the depth psychology. So everything I read, I reflected on how it applies in my life versus let me just memorize this for a test. Let me write a paper. I tried to write the papers to the best of my ability, processing my personal story. And even if I couldn't do it in a paper, 
I journaled about it on the side, and then I took it to my favorite theology professor, who also has a background in counseling and depth psychology and spirituality, and masculine spirituality and psychology. So I used the theology degree as another therapeutic tool, along with yoga and meditation and journaling and the pain and suffering. We got to leverage it into, quote, post-traumatic growth. There is always a lesson to be learned. So that's what we need to be asking. Like, what is the lesson to be learned? What is my soul asking of me? If you're a person of faith, what is God asking of me in all of this? And it doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant. And unfortunately, a lot of our upbringing, at least in America, I don't know over there, like you go to at least the church and maybe the other religions too. And it's kind of like, if you follow the rules, everything should be hunky dory. And it's like, no, there's, and then you think when it's not great, you think that you're sinning, you're not tithing, or I didn't go to church on Sunday. I'm not praying enough. I'm not memorizing the Bible enough. No, pain and suffering is coming to everyone at some time. It doesn't mean you're being punished. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you, Amazing. but those are hard things to overcome and just realize there's going to be a lesson in all of our pain and suffering one way or the other. And it doesn't mean we're going to be happy through it, but you got to find the meaning in the suffering and the lessons to be learned, or you're going to stay stuck in ruts and probably self-medicate numb and distract yourself in very unhealthy ways. Completely. Like everything you've said, I'm like, yep. 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 So if you're if, for the listeners and viewers that are listening, which part of that resonates with you? Because it is so true. Like all of that's so true. Uh, the, we all have to experience pain to have pleasure. We need to find the lesson in everything that we do, whether it's painful or pleasurable. Uh, today was, I, I ran a group training for some, for law enforcement department for about four hours today. I literally sat down and went, what went well, what didn't go well. And I wrote out both. The lists are about the same length <laughs> because it's like, cool. That way I can learn from what didn't go well. So the next time it does. And I do that every single time. I do that with everything I do, the gym, my training, my mindset, my, you know, last night leading into this training, leading up to these podcasts, all of it. So it's really learning that and sinking into what's in, what works for you. So Matt, what are some of the things, because I know you're helping a lot of guys out there and women, uh, you're helping a lot of our frontline out there, whether it be police or, or, or one of the others, uh, uh, fire, ambos, any of it, I'm pretty sure if anybody came to you, you wouldn't turn away. Uh, but with those police officers that you're seeing, I know we talked about before we jumped on here, one of the areas that you help out with, it's not uncommon for you to see a murderer when you're in the back of that squad car, like you said, with that cage and your knees up around your ear. How, what is the one thing, what's the top thing that you kind of help them or when they do come to you, you say so that they don't get burned out? Because I know definition wise, burnout and PTSD are very similar. Just PTSD has the, as the diagnosis of the depression, the anxiety, the, Whereas the, the, the core of the definition uh, is, is very similar. Uh, what is the one thing that you always just kind of try and promote or try and um, get them to hear or realize uh, so that they don't burn out, so that, the, that PTSD doesn't take over them, so that they can keep being that, imp you know, that impactful cop? So I wouldn't say that I there's things that I want them to hear. I would say the most valuable thing that I've done based on the feedback I get, and I used to be a chaplain at a rehab center for cops and firemen too, where I'd be there 10 to 14 hours back to back doing one-on-ones. And that's you. that was the most intense because they had gotten to the point that drugs or alcohol and PTSD had caught up. So the, the most feedback I get on, I've gotten that's helpful, and there is, some, there is research behind this, people being able to share their story, not be listened to very attentively, not be judged, not get unsolicited bullshit advice, and to be understood and heard. So to be for the best thing I can do is be a very attentive listener and validate people's feelings and mirror back the normalcy of whatever they might be feeling or thinking for the shit show that cops and firemen see. Like it's not normal to see 
kids killed or, you know, speak to a woman after they're raped or people that have compound fractures in a car accident or just be dealing with people that are pissed off for a 10 or a 12 hour or a double shift. So I think the most valuable thing I can do is listen very attentively and not judge, not give advice and let them and they and them saying, like, I know you care. And they just get to share their story and get it off their chest. And a lot of good therapy is getting to share your story to an objective person, because sometimes our friends and family are too biased and can be uncomfortable hearing the types of stories cops have and give stupid advice because they're uncomfortable or want to fix. And it's not always about or they're projecting their own crap over onto that. Oh, for sure. Of that, of what that person's saying. And that's the, that's yeah. the biggest thing is they take, you said blah, blah, blah about this. And they, they sit there and they put it into their complicator in their brain and they spit out their meaning of what it means to them. Not just going, yeah, I understand. But, you know, and, and just, and just literally, like you said, giving that kind of reality check of, Oh, but what about this person? And not saying that they have to do that or anything. And it's, it is, it's, it's, it's that coaching, isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. So that, and then when the opportunity arises, like checking in on sleep, because that's a huge issue with first responders, the badge of honors for the guy that slept three hours, drinks three Red Bulls, three coffees, does a bunch of dip, Whatever. So sleep quality, your nutrition, your gut health affects your mood, your inflammation. (laughs) Like, so nutrition, the exercise, having life balance, having hobbies as it comes up to ask questions about people's lives and, you know, kind of check in on some of these different areas. I love love that because I've been trying, I've been, I've been working to, you know, and talking with people here and police psychologists and stuff like that. And I've been asked, what's the one thing that you, if you, you know, endless kind of money and you could implement into the department, I was like, mandatory debriefs after every shift. And when I say debriefs, I mean, everybody just goes through the room and just kind of says what's kind of come up with them over the shift Mm -hmm. or just being able to talk and listen and having it so that you build that camaraderie even more than just hoorah, hoorah, hoorah. I slept three hours and I took this criminal down. I did this. No, like more of, well, how the shift, you know, how are you doing after this shift? Like the actual, how, how, are, how are things? How's your wife? How's your kids? Because then it, it brings that in. It brings that communication in and, and normalizing the fact that the job that you do is not normal and you shouldn't think it's normal. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I, I love, I love, I love what you said. Um, now we talked a little bit already about purpose and purpose is one of those things that I think is one of the biggest underrated, um, things in law enforcement, first responding, and really within anyone, if you have no purpose, you have no drive. Um, there was a quote, uh, that's in my, in my training that I run, uh, without a why you have no way. Or without a purpose, you have no way. You know, you get mm-hmm. lost in the, in the clouds. So, my why and my mission statement, as I help people do, because your mission statement, your personal mission statement, from when and mine comes from when I was a kid. Um, all I believe all whys and purposes, the true comes from when you were a child, and then it's been reconcreted in over the years and over the years, and then in turn, we then either live it in a positive way or live it in a negative way, or we interpret it in different ways. But once you actually have the the true meaning of it and the true mission statement, it becomes that anchor, uh, a a, a sort of faith as such. Um, Mine is, I, my mission statement is I help myself and other, I help, I help us see, I help people see themselves. I see, help myself see myself. I help others see myself. Also we create the best version of ourselves. So my why or my purpose in life is consistently to help people see themselves. Mm -hmm. Matt, what would you say your why or purpose that has driven you through literally your entire life would be? And where do you think it comes from? Well, my entire life, I don't know what as a kid, obviously we have a lot of genetics and environmental factors, but I was for whatever reason, even as a kid, very strict and disciplined with nutrition and fitness, super inquisitive. 
spending a lot of time alone in the woods, already journaling, even as the football meathead with a mullet and kind of a wild party animal, I was always uh, very introspective. And then when it came to undergrad and I had a big football injury and kind of a come to Jesus transition, I got deeper into the meditation and the journaling and all that stuff. And ever since undergrad, my purpose is basically to evaluate every day Hey, based on the life experiences, the gifts and the talents I have, where they they meet a need in the world that I care about. And that's where I'm going to be the most useful because I have a passion about doing whatever it is. Um, and I'm also going to be fed. So it's going to be feeding whoever I'm serving and also feeding me. It's not how much money I can make or what looks good on the resume or what can I put on my uh, business card? What title, you know? So what gifts, talents, purposes, and based on the lessons I've learned, and if anybody has studied the hero's journey, and if they haven't, they should, you know, we're all going to go through um, leaving our familiar and comfort zone in life, whether we want to or not at some point, and we're going to go through adversity and we're going to have foes, we're going to have mentors, we're going to have colleagues and strangers that help us along the way. And eventually through the hardship, you're going to have a gift to bring back to your community, whether that community is your friends and family. Is it other cops? Is it people at your faith community? Or is it just being nicer to the people at Starbucks and the grocery store? Like you're going to learn if you learn lessons, they're meant for you to pass on in some way or pay it forward. So my mission is to continue to evaluate based on my faith, where is God calling me to use the lessons I've learned and my gifts and talents to serve others? Mm. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, what if somebody, what about those, those guys and gals out there that are struggling with their purpose? What would you say to help them figure that purpose out or get realigned, more importantly, get realigned with their purpose? The first thing I think anybody needs to do is, can you tell me what the most important values are in your life? Can you define them? So you need to define what the most important values are in your life. And you got to define to me what your mission is every day. Like when you wake up, what's your mission or, or purpose, the mission or purpose statement, and then what the most important values are, because only then can you say at the end of your shift or the end of your day, let me reflect on the interactions with the people I had, the calls I went on and the talks I had in the locker room or briefing and roll call or how I treated the people at the coffee shop in the grocery store or the restaurant. And did I embody and live out my values? Am I walking the talk? Am I practicing what I am preaching? And you can't do that unless you know what you say your most important values are and what your mission is. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's it's so true um yeah i without without your i i take people through a seven seven step process and so in turn find all the different levels of of where of, of your mission statement and then also create that mission statement and it's so it's so and it's, it's based off of i don't i've done my neuro linguistic programming um masters in that and so it's based off of values you're literally creating the values of your why going through the process. Then I take them through a thing where you, you actually set the rules around it, the rules that work for it and the rules that don't. And half the time when people create their first ones, they're like, Oh my God, none of this is being met ever. How am I actually living each day? And so then when mm -hmm. you, go and you recreate them, so they're always being achieved or the ones that don't work for the, 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 the parts of your life that don't work for you, the rules so that they actually end up working for you. And so it is, it's so interesting that you said values because it is based off of values technique in neuro linguistic programming is actually figuring out what are your values? Because if you don't know your values, again, it's like having, it's like, I call, I refer to it as, as cops. We can't, we really get it. Refer to it as shooting the target at the range with a blindfold on. Mm -hmm. When you don't know your values, you don't know your mission statement. You don't know your purpose. You're shooting at that target, hoping to hit it. And occasionally you'll hit it because it's straight in front of you. Occasionally you'll hit it and when you hit it, you get all excited. You, woohoo, you know, the boys are all congratulating on that. And then you shoot again and you miss and you shoot again and you miss and you shoot again and you miss. And you're like, God damn it. You start to go, why can't I get back on target? But when you do know, as he said, the values and the mission statement and the purpose, 
you take the blindfold off and you just hit that bullseye over and over and over and over again. Do you find that's true? By defining my values yeah, and my mission values, statement? You know, your mission statement and knowing your purpose and, and staying focused on them each day? I mean, for the things that are in my control in my life, I've accomplished a lot of my goals athletically, academically, and career-wise by defining the values, making sure I'm living out those values, my mission and purpose, but also short, medium, and long-term goal setting and paying attention to that and then putting in the work. And, and, and just, it's hard, whatever it is, don't procrastinate until it's perfect timing to do it or until you have the perfect plan because doing the very basic things in life with passion, consistency, and discipline will get you super far. And that's nutrition, that's exercise, that's pretty much anything. Just put in a little consistency with discipline and passion and you'll make progress. Don't wait until the ideal time because favorable conditions never come or never stay no no they, they no they don't i always say i mean i've always been told by coaches and stuff as well take messy action it's better than no action at all you'll at least get something mm -hmm. figure out what worked and you'll figure out what doesn't work by taking messy action <laughs> so take some sort of action um awesome what would be your in general your number one piece of advice for listeners when it comes to their frontline career, their law enforcement career. To, to get number over number. the stigma that, well, if I could drill in that self-care isn't selfish, mm -hmm. taking care of your sleep, your nutrition, your fitness, your life balance, your values, your purpose, whatever brand or version of spirituality, whether you believe in anything or not, live out your values. Um, Learn how to be more aware of your thoughts and feelings. And that's where journaling and therapy can come in or any type of yoga or Tai Chi, Qi Gong, going for a walk in nature, spending time alone, fasting from technology. Like I challenge people to drive home from their shift with the cell phone off, the radio off. You're not, I mean, audio books are good. Podcasts are good, but drive home from your shift, whether it's five minutes or an hour and do it in silence. And just pay attention to what comes up. Learn to differentiate and it's practice your thoughts and feelings. Because I even do it in therapy all the time. He asks me how I'm feeling and I tell him what I'm thinking, you know. But we need to learn to pay attention to our thoughts. We need to learn to pay attention to our feelings, acknowledge and become aware of them. Because most of our lives are driven by unconscious things, patterns, and us reacting that we're not aware of. So... Spend more time in silence. Try to spend more time in nature. Go to therapy. Go on the down low. If you have the benefits to go to therapy, don't wait until you're hurting or broken. Therapy, or if you have a clergy you trust, go to a mentor and unload. Find somebody that you can share your story with on a regular basis outside of your friends and family that just listens to you and doesn't give you advice and doesn't judge you. Find that person. If you can't find that person, pay for a therapist or start searching clergy that, you know, should be doing it for free and find somebody that you trust. So we need to share our stories. We need to pay attention to our thoughts and feelings, and we need to reflect every day if we're living out on our values. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, when it comes to meditation, because I know a lot of cops especially are like, oh, meditation, woo woo, got to sit there. I mean, you said a few times, you, you, you do it for a couple hours and that. I've found for myself, and tell me if, I'm, if I've been barking up the wrong tree because you do it a lot more than I do, but I found that you kind of said it in that last little bit, uh, find peace. I ride motorcycles. I love motorcycles because it's that peace that I turn the music off or the speakers off in my, head, in my helmet because I have them there. And I just listen to myself and I find that's a form of meditation. I start to let things come in and go and, and just relax because you can't be focused on anything else. It's not like a car where you can kind of you just go, whatever, you know, you can kind of doze off on a motorcycle. If you're not aware and letting those thoughts flow out and not getting fixated on them, you literally will die. 
as you probably mm -hmm. have been to many, many, many motorcycle crashes and that probably in your years, would you, would you say that, 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 that's a, it's, it's an effective way of doing a form of meditation? What some people get gardening, some people get it surfing, some people get it fishing, some people get it sitting in a deer stand hunting. Yeah. Like when you're alone and you're having some form of silence and you can reflect, like that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So reflecting on your life is a beautiful thing, or just having an activity that makes you be present to the moment. It's where you're not thinking about the future or worrying about the past. Whatever makes you present, playing music, artwork, woodworking, like there's a lot of different things that I, that I would consider your motorcycle riding spiritual practice, just like a ton of people out here in Manhattan Beach surfing. That's their spiritual practice. I'm sure they're in the moment and they're they're not consumed with what they have to do the rest of the day. And there's moments that pass by without them being aware of time. No, so, and then a big, hey, go ahead. and a big thing with meditation is people there's so there's a thousand different ways. If anybody tells you this is the perfect way or the right way to meditate, or this is the perfect diet or the perfect workout system run the other way, there's no one perfect way to do anything. Everybody has individual variation. And if you're evolving and growing your diets, your workouts, your prayer, your faith, your meditation will change too. But the, the one big thing is people will be like, I can't do it, Matt. Like, I can't wipe my mind or blank my mind out. I, I start thinking about all kinds of things. Like, and that's called the monkey mind. And I'm like, no, you're doing it right. Because you turned off the TV, your cell phone, the internet. You're not distracting yourself. Now you just became aware of everything that's going on in your head that you're normally distracting yourself from. And unless you're some kind of Buddhist or Catholic monk, like everybody that meditates fights, say like a thought comes up and do you chase that thought and dwell on it or not? And a lot of times I may, but then I have to call myself back to the breath, like let that go, come back to the breath or whatever the technique is. So just spending time in silence, no matter what it is, is good. You're going to become silent, solitude, immersion in nature fasting from technology. Yeah. And if you have motorcycle riding, jogging, walking, surfing, art, playing the music, if you put it woodworking, if it puts you in the zone and you're paying attention to your thoughts or feelings or present in the moment, great. Do more of that, whatever that is. Yeah. No, I, 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 I love that. I love the, 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 the clarity for everybody listening. Um, because it's, yeah, it's so true. I've got a, a half a dozen different things that, that do that. It, it is. It's amazing at how clear the mind becomes afterwards and how present you become, um, which is, which is, which is awesome. Uh, my question for you, because you've been journaling for a very long time and I know first responders in that will be like, oh, journaling, you want me to write everything down? Then people are going to get their hands <laughs> on it and they've got this and then blah, blah, blah. You know, all the different ex excuses under the, under the sun come out. What is your, what technique would you recommend for people when it comes to journaling? Because I know I've got my technique of just literally brain dumping and my, my journal literally looks like a psychopath and a crazy person because anything that pops into my head, that whole meditation type just goes onto the piece of paper. Um, what's your technique or what technique would you, you know, say? I do that. If something's bothering me, I will just write about it and, you know, cause it's sharing my story. Yeah. It's getting it off my chest. And if, if it's negative stuff and it's bothering you, print it out, shred it or print it out and burn it, <laughs> you know, and keep doing it. You know, so there's that method. There's the um, gratitude journal. Yeah. You know, think about three things today that you are thankful for. Like I sat down and talked to certain cops today, like super thankful. I haven't seen some of them in a while. A number of them got promoted to detective. Great. I got to work out with a cop today. You know, like I didn't want to do cardio today. So I'm doing my lift. And this guy set up the sled, farmer's walk, med ball and the prowler. And I was like, I need to do some conditioning. So seeing him do that motivated me. So I jumped in and unexpectedly 
there was a couple of times my girlfriend's really busy today, but then she FaceTimed me at a time I totally un, was unexpected, like, sweet, yeah. write about that. And then write about my thoughts and feelings around each of those things. If I want to get more specific, these are the things I'm grateful and thankful for because our brains tend to naturally, we think about the things that are upsetting and negative in our worry. So we got to retrain our brain. And if you write about the things you're thankful for, and the thoughts and the feelings that they bring up. I, I went to Urban Plates, which is organic food. And I'm like, I need to save money. My money's so tight. But I was like, no, I'm going to splurge today. But the guy knows that I'm a retired cop and a chaplain. So he gave me 50% off. So I got a grass-fed steak dinner and some ahi tuna for 11 bucks. I'm yeah. super thankful for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's another method. Write about things you're thankful for. Then write about your goals like and what did i do today to get better i have high blood pressure right now over some different things including work comp scares that turned out not to be true but it reminds me of that legal case so it spikes my blood pressure um you know i've had a problem in this living situation i'm in a small apartment with a vacation rental above me and i've had tons of loud people disrupting my sleep what can i do to lower my blood pressure exercise, eat clean, meditate. So right, what, what is a problem or a goal you have and journal about what you're doing every day to get better at that or accomplish that mission or goal. Wow. Hold yourself accountable. I love it, Matt. So many, so many good, so many good um, resources and ideas. Uh, how can somebody get in touch with you if they want to, Matt? Are you happy with them to reach out to you directly? Yeah. Yeah. My website's www.tacticalchaplain.com. Tacticalchaplain.com. My contact's on there. Uh, I think the email I use the most for uh, like the peer support is Matt, M-A-T-T period, Damiancic, D-O-M-Y-A-N-C-I-C at globalassociates.org. So Matt period, Damiancic at globalassociates.org. That's on the website. There's only two Matt Damiancic, some distant cousins. So you can find me on LinkedIn. And I'm pretty sure my I should have the tactical chaplain website, and my email, but you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, those are should be two simple ways to get in touch. And my Instagram is thin blue line spirituality. Thin blue line spirituality. And I did start a the tactical chaplain, but that I, I'm not as active on that. But thin blue line spirituality is my Instagram. All right, so we'll put all those links um, in the um, description down below. Anyways, uh, last thing I like to ask Matt before I kind of do let you you know open it up to you a little bit. What would be your top tip to self happiness? The top tip. Top tip for self happiness. Self happiness. I don't know if I have a tip because. I don't know for me if pursuing happiness is something I do at this point. It's the pursuit of meaning because a lot of times life is not happy. So I might say, go back to defining your values, defining what your mission is in life or every day. Like what's your mission as a cop? What's your mission as a family or friend and reflect every night, even if it's five minutes, Am I living out my mission? Am I living my values? Am I practicing what I preach? Am I walking the talk? That would be the take five or 10 minutes in silence and think about your day. And are you living out the values that you claim are important to you and try to drive home from your shift in silence and just pay attention to what comes up? Oh, I love that. I love that, Matt. Well, thanks so much. Do you have any final words or final things that you'd like to say? Yeah, some of the things I always say are, one, remember, self-care is not selfish. Self-care is not selfish. The more you take care of yourself, the better you're going to be to your family, to your friends, to the community, and as a cop. Because if your well goes dry, you can't give anybody a drink of water. So you got to keep your cup filled. And when you have problems, seek help. There's no shame in therapy. I go to therapy and 
I like therapy and spiritual direction, even if it's not crisis. Sharing your story with trusted people. If you need help with anything, don't be bashful. Like, do it on the down low. And we need to remember as first responders and veterans and humans, pain that is not transformed is transmitted. And that's Richard Rohr. Pain that is not transformed is transmitted, meaning, and another quote that relates, if you don't heal what hurt you, you will bleed on people that did not cut you. If you do not heal what hurt you, you will bleed on people that did not cut you. So if that starts out as your parents treated you like crap or you are a victim of abuse or bullying, that there's unconscious programming that you're spilling out onto other people most likely. And as cops and firemen, you're exposed to pain and suffering all the time. And you're going to take it home or you're going to take it on the next call and it's going to eat you up inside unless you transform and process that pain. I say we all have a misery cup. This is after listening to hundreds of stories. People will have things from childhood that were not ideal or adverse childhood experiences. They'll go to combat, see terrible things. They'll become a cop or a fireman, see terrible things. They self-medicate, they numb, they distract, they suck it up, the suck it up mentality. Eventually the divorce comes or the knee surgery that gets you on opiates or the next call with a dead kid. And then your misery cup overflows and you remember your parents' divorce. You remember the combat trauma. You remember all the shitty calls from the last 15 years that you hadn't thought of, but you totally suppressed, compartmentalized or disassociated from but they will bite you on the ass. It all goes somewhere. So anything shitty or painful you experienced as a kid or at any time in your career, you got to confront it. Hopefully like say in therapy or with the clergy member or worst case with the journaling and the writing and also doing the meditation and the surfing and the art and the music, all of these things help us be grounded and present and try to like, and they do increase neuroplasticity and brain healing. So there's science behind it, but we got to process the, the pain that happened to us or we're going to pass it on to someone else. Yeah. And it'll be at the most inopportune time when you do something you don't mean to actually do. Yeah. Which we've seen a bit of over the last few years as well. You know, it's, yeah. Awesome. I love it, Matt. Well, this is Fight the Burnout. Uh, this is where we interview now first responders only, uh, frontline officers, so that you can learn something from our past or our current present uh, and how, how first responders work through it. Uh, I want to thank Matt again for being here today from the other side of the world, from my home state, from California. Uh, and uh, yeah, remember, I always say this. There is a lot of stuff during this episode. Just take one thing and start taking action on it. Take one thing from today and start taking action on it because then you'll actually start to make a shift. Two degrees every day till the end of the year is, I don't even know the number. It's, uh, it's exponential. Uh, the graph just keeps growing. And so just by implementing one thing today, you're going to shift and change your life by the end of the year. I can guarantee it. Uh, thanks for listening. Make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you share this around as well. We want to impact as many people as we can. We're on a mission to... Uh, help first responders and frontline and people in general reclaim their mental health. So uh, that's what we're here for. And I want to thank you again, Matt. I uh, very much appreciate it. And thank you everybody for listening or watching. And we will see you on the next episode.